Okay, let's get this started. Um, any questions? Really? Okay. Uh, I'll continue where I left off in the last lecture. I'm just going to do uh, a few more examples of the root locus uh, method. So in the last lecture, we were looking at uh, a proportional integral control. And the basic idea is after you get the effective transfer function for a closed loop system with a feedback, we want to find out where the roots of the characteristic equations are. And the characteristic equation is always this 1 plus g, where g is called the open loop transfer function, which is the product of all the transfer functions in the loop. And uh, typically, k is the net gain for the loop that includes or embeds in it kc, the controller tuning parameter. And uh, we, we introduce the terminology. In the denominator, we call these as pulls. And in the numerator, these are called zero. And when you have only a proportional controller, there is no zero. And when there is a proportion of the integral controller, there is one zero. When there is a derivative, of integral and derivative controller, as we'll see in the next problem, there will be two zeros. And the pulls and zeros have some connection, which I didn't talk about last lecture, but I showed you the picture of how the root locus uh, diagram looks like. And um, let me show that diagram and then um, come back and see try to understand. So this was the particular root locus diagram for the that particular problem. Okay. So that problem has uh, a fourth degree polynomial in the denominator and uh, it has let's switch back, it has one pole at the origin s equal to zero. And there are three other poles. So there are total four poles and one zero. Okay. And I want to look at more carefully how these poles are located and related to the zeros. So here you see the four cross marks in MATLAB. Those are the four poles. And there is a pole there at the origin as you can see. Those are at k equal to zero. And you should be able to connect that because when you put k equal to zero in this particular equation, this whole term will drop out. And all you get is s equal to zero or s equal to p1 or s equal to p2 or p3. Those are the four poles in the limiting case of k equal to zero or kc equal to zero. Okay? So those are very easy to locate. And then as k changes, the poles, the roots are going to change. Okay? And my question to you is, by looking at that, can you say anything about where the zero should be located? Remember, this is a characteristic equation, and we want to solve for those values of s where that is equal to zero, the roots of that equation. Okay? So it is clear, it's obvious by looking at it, when k equals to zero, I drop out this term completely, so the poles are located at its original position, p1, p2, p3, which is related to the time constant. Okay? Now, when my question is, where would the zero be located? Maybe I'll show you the uh, diagram, and let's take a peek at it. What is the zero here? The zero is the one that is indicated by the symbol O. Okay. So, question to ask is, are all the poles related to zero, or is there one pole that is related to zero? And uh, how do these roots uh, traverse this graph as you change k? For example, if I take this root, this is the green curve that goes down. As k changes, as k changes, this curve goes down like this. Goes to infinity, it will just keep on going like this. And we are interested primarily in the crossover point. Similarly, if you take this route, as k changes, it goes left first, and then goes up, and then crosses, and goes to infinity. 
Okay? So those two zeros go infinity like that. Now if you take the red curve that is starting from here, it goes like this and then comes down, meaning it has a complex root, and then it comes back to the real axis and then goes away all the way to infinity. So the third pole goes to infinity towards the left. Okay? The first and the second one went towards the right. Now there is one, the fourth one that starts here, this is the green curve, and then goes back and comes and ends up in the zero. Okay? So there is a structure to it that I want you to get at because later on as we extend this you'll find how many poles and zeros are connected like this. And uh, how can I understand that by looking at this graph? Now let's look at this equation again. We looked at the graph, let's look at this equation. Okay? So what as k goes to infinity, what should happen to this graph? Uh, what should happen to this equation and hence the graph that comes from that? As k goes to infinity. If I ask you the question, what would go through your mind? k is going to infinity, okay? Suppose I divide by k both sides, both terms. That's the second term dominant, exactly. Okay? So, S equal to Z1 is one of the solutions. Okay? So, one of the rules of the equation must be the zero. Okay? So, always when you have a numerator which is first degree and denominator which is a higher degree, at least one of those poles must connect to the zero. We'll see later on. When the numerator is second degree, two of those poles will connect to the zero. Okay, so that is the general structure of the root locus diagram which tells us how many roots there are and how they traverse and the most important point that you have to get out of this is that value of kc where the root goes to the right hand side. Then the system becomes unstable of those values of kc uh, beyond that. Okay, any questions on that? Later on, we will see uh, empirical methods for tuning the controller constant. And we will do a test uh, online in a real plant. Yeah, question. Infinity, right. So if you want to, for example, look at the values of k by simply clicking on the graph, as you click on this one, you will find that its value is infinity. So uh, the important point, as I said, is to find out that value of kc. What is the value of kc here, or the value of k, where the system becomes unstable? Uh, another question, I guess, that uh, maybe you, you have already grasped by now because we've been talking about this for so long, is how, how do we, how does MATLAB generate this graph? All I give MATLAB is the time open loop transfer function. How does it generate? such a graph, can you write, if I ask you as an assignment, write a script for me that will generate this graph, how will you go about it? And the reason for going through this is it makes you understand the process of um, how to generate this graph yourself, which is what you will be asked to do in an exam, okay? Because you're not going to have uh, access to our local function. So all of that, math like that, is you are defining the open loop transfer function G, okay? And it has to formulate 1 plus g equal to 0. So you give this to MATLAB. So it formulates 1 plus g equal to 0. And then formulate this characteristic equation. Because g will have a numerator and denominator, so you need to simplify that. And then it treats k as a parameter, which automatically switches from 0 to infinity. Okay? 0 to infinity. And it will, of course, infinity is a concept, okay? unless you are 0. Yeah. That, 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 that question, I mean, I'm glad that you asked that question. That question is, will be answered once you go through this process. Okay. Question is, which root is which? Okay. How many roots there are? That is, you can MATLAB can analyze by simply knowing the highest degree of the polynomial. Okay. And um, does it have to know which root is which? Okay. Um, so it just has to generate for each value of k a set of roots and then connect them by a point. And once you see this, how you would generate such a table, you will understand how MATLAB 
answer the question which rule is which. Okay. So, do you have any questions on this one? Given G, you should be able to write in an exam the characteristic equation with K as a parameter. And calculators, I'm sure, can solve these rules, right? The calculators can solve any degree polynomial. Yeah. Okay, so when k equal to zero, we already know the rules. And these are the that is put k equal to zero here. And k equal to zero, you are left with the poles. Okay, so the poles are located at zero minus one minus two minus three. You don't see it in the expanded form, but if you see it in a factored form, that's one of the reasons why you write it as a factored form in terms of the poles. You know where the starting points are for the roots. Okay. So this program is slightly different from what I put earlier. I just figured out this morning that there are a few more functions that one can use in MATLAB. What does it do? Okay. Uh, maybe I should do this uh, in MATLAB. <laughs> now let me just go through it, explain it, and then we will, uh, if you feel that there is a need for me to demonstrate it, I will. Okay? So the first line we understand, right? I'm just defining two symbols, k and f. f is the Laplace variable, and k is the symbol in the polynomial expression. Everything else is a number. Okay? So I have a polynomial written in terms of the denominator in that uh, equation of 1 plus g equal to 0. Okay? So I'm expanding it. So expand is a function that will expand the factored form. Okay? So this is the factored form that appears, and I'm expanding it. And I'm storing it in t. What would t be? A number or a symbol? It's an expression. It's symbolic processing. So expand is a symbolic processing function, which expands it and produces t as an expression. Uh, maybe I think it's probably better that I do this for that. Okay. So it's both parts. K F. Okay. And then P is equal to expand S times S plus one times S. If I make any mistake and typo, please correct me. S plus 3 plus k times S plus 4. Okay. I just want you to see what kind of results it produces. Okay. So it's going to expand and produce a symbolic expression. A symbolic expression that is 4 bigger in that, but with k as a symbol. What you're trying to do is answer the question, how does MATLAB solve that generate the root of this plot? Okay. Um, then what I'm doing is I'm there is a function in symbolic toolbox called COEFFS coefficient. So you throw a polynomial expression, and remember when you throw this expression, this has two symbols, S and K. So it could be treated as a polynomial in S, could be treated as a polynomial in K. But if there's a polynomial in K, what is the highest degree? First degree. Okay. So what I want is to extract all the coefficients, treating it as a polynomial in F. Okay. So I'm going to call this as uh, C equals COE F of S. Put the polynomial and say treat it as a polynomial in F. So the first argument is the expression itself, the polynomial expression. The second one identify which of those symbols should be treated as a variable. Treat everything else as a constant and collect these terms. What do you notice about that coefficient? It's backwards. That's what I wanted you to notice first. Okay. So it, it, it gives you the lowest term first, and then s, and then s squared, s cubed, and so on. Okay. Now you know the roots function, right? Roots function will take this and calculate the roots for you. But the roots function requires the polynomial order to be backwards. Okay. So you just search for another function, and there is one that flips it. It's called flip left to right, flip LR. <laughs> okay. So pass that C. Okay. 
plus L R T and then I want to save it in the same variable too. Okay. So this is still a coefficient, but is it symbol or number? It's a symbol. Okay, because K appears there. Okay. So it is a symbol. And now I'm ready to pass this to the roots function, but roots function expects only a number. Okay. So now what we need to do is but maybe let me ask you, what do I need to do? Put in various values of k and evaluate that and then pass it to roots and I can generate a table. Okay. So if you look at the program here setting up a loop, for k equals zero to ten. So ten is a thing about and set the set of the set of two. the 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 of the set the set of the set the set of the set the set of the set the 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 so it's really not a very difficult task to write our locus if you want to do that, right? It's not a magic. Our locus doesn't do any magical thing. All it does is has this kind of a code, four or five lines. It's not very difficult, okay? So for k equal to 0, 2, 3, 20, let's do that, okay? So r equals its roots. Huh? Okay. I'm doing this interactively, so the loop is not executing until it sees the end. So the moment I put an end, what's going to happen? It's going to go through that loop as many times as it's needed and print out R value for each one of those. Those are all the root values. For k equals 0, 2, 4, etc. Okay. Now you can put them in the form of a table. And that's what I've shown here. Organize them in the form of a table. So when k equals to 0, you have the four roots. And by studying this table, what can you say about stability? Right? And I'm still at k equals to 4. So somewhere in between one root, or in this case two roots, a pair of complex roots, has a positive real part. Okay? Now the question might be, okay, find me the value much Closer. I don't. I want to know. Is it three, three point five, three point five five four? What did you do then? So decrease your steps. Okay. So I have another program later on that will tell you how to search this. We talked about the bisection method, the idea of uh, interval halving. Okay. So uh, I will show the code later on, but that's the basic concept. Okay. So this now all you need to do is take this data and pass it to the plot routine. But how many plots? How many times do you have to call? Four times because there are four columns, there are four rows. So if you had a fifth degree polynomial, you have to draw five graphs, five curves on the same uh, plot. Okay. So MATLAB has to do all this analysis of finding what is the highest order because its order locus is general. We can throw any symbolic expression at it. So it starts out, constructs the denominator, extracts the coefficient, passes it to rows, and that's all this bookkeeping job for this. Okay. That's all there is to it. So, sorry, now, is, is that answer what kind of your question? Which root is which? Not answer. No, I mean, whenever I find roots in my paper, I put a thing to work on one. How does that last code that the parts of the four roots, one point, one case, how does it know that one of the parts of the four roots are different? How does it know that the Look at it and tell how the computer. I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> that's enough. The only time you heard that. The, the, yeah. It's it's simply connecting the points, assuming that each is continuously connected. So what what it has to do is uh, when, for example, your that's a good question. It's a programming question. Okay. 
So when your starting point is clear, put k equal to zero, you know where the poles are. Starting point is clear. Now, if I take directly from that k equal to eight, for k equal to eight, it has to solve for four roots, and it might get this as the first root and put it in here. That's your question, right? And so if that happens, the connectivity information is not there. Okay, so what we are really asking for is, how do we know that this curve connects a continuous set of roots evolving from k equal to zero? The only way you can guarantee that is by taking small steps in k. If I change k, they cannot convert to the same point. Yeah, yeah. And then they have very good eyes, right. <laughs> but what, what you're going to do is, I have to look at the R locus logic for that, okay? Uh, R locus is probably a function that you can. It's not arbitrary, it cannot be arbitrary. R locus is actually a script, you can look at it, okay? Um, what it has to do from programming experience would be to increment k in small amounts, okay, particularly when uh, there is a, the roots locations change by a lot, you make a small amount of k, then it could give you a problem in connectivity. So this is, the idea is called a continuation. So basically you make small increments in k and assume that produces small changes in your location of the roots. And so if you make that assumption, and that assumption one can always construct an example where that assumption fails. And so the root locus will not look correct. Root locus is not going to handle for all kinds of problems. No program can handle every situation, confuse the situation. Okay? And this is why they always argue that the Star Wars program can fail, right? So there's no absolute guarantee with any program. Uh, but for most of the situations, it will, assuming that this continuity, by making incremental changes in k, you can produce a continuous curve. Okay? And when that continuous curve merges, what would happen is you would track each root separately. So if these two roots, for example, merge at one point where they have same root, but by continuing the same thing, you will continue to project in the same path. Okay? So now there are, I don't think root locus implement this algorithm, but there are ways that you can ensure that you're following the same path. By not only uh, making small changes, but taking a tangent to the curve at every point and making sure that you're following in the same direction. Okay? And that's the most of to get an idea in terms of uh, continuation method. That's a very good question, very observant question. Okay. Um, Plus, minus, yeah, yeah. They should change. This should be mine. Uh, yeah, that should be a minus. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I just cut and paste, but let me see if I made a mistake from there. Okay, so basically, that's how you generate your our local method. Yeah. Ah. Okay, this is good, good question, good question, because, yeah, I didn't really talk about it. I said, here is a table, the next command is just block in there. What are you blocking? <laughs> Keep me honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, think about it. How would I, what am I plotting on the graph? And where is the data? Now, you know how to generate the data. The data is right in front of you. Obviously, on the x-axis, we are not plotting k, right? We are not. The, the real part. On the x-axis, we are plotting the real part. On the y-axis, we are plotting the imaginary part. So each curve will come from one column of data. There are two numbers here. Okay. 
one column of data. So you need to take the real part and you take the imaginary part and plus the real part against an imaginary part. One curve. Yeah, exactly. Arnold will give you one curve, or two will give you one curve, etc. like that. But disconnect the dots. And when you're connecting the dots, if you have such a large value of k, it will be uh, this large straight lines. So if you're proud of it, you need to make sure that you have sufficiently close enough values of k so that you get a smooth curve. You need smaller stuff. But in an exam, I will test on this idea that whether you can plot the root locus, saying calculate the three, three values of k and locate those on the root locus area. Okay. That's a good one. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Next, I say answer the following question. This is a statement from one of the textbooks in control uh, topic. So the effect of adding integral action has been to destabilize the system in terms of the amount of proportional action that can be used before instability occurs. Now, if you're going through a course like this, you should be able to decipher and understand what it says. What is it saying? Yeah. But how far you are, like if you're on the stable Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So another way of stating what both of you said would be to if there is really is the problem if I am plotting in a two parameter curve, Kc versus tau i. Okay. So you give me a value of tau i. Suppose tau i is infinite. What does that mean? No integral action. Okay. So I'm somewhere way up here and I find a particular value of Kc above which the system becomes unstable. I found the stability boundary. So my question at this stage is what they are trying to tell you is, or ask, I'm phrasing it into question, as I decrease tau i, as I go in this direction, is Kc going to the left or is Kc going to the right? That Kc, critical Kc, where the stability boundary is. Okay? So this is the value of Kc for which the proportional system became unstable when there was no integral action. As an add integral action, adding integral action has been to destabilize the system in terms of the amount of proportional action that can be used before instability occurs. So tell me now, if you understand this, uh, in the curve, at check curve, which is just a stability boundary, stability boundary for Kc as tau i is changing, is it going to go like this or is it going to go like this? What do they mean? You understand the question? No? Okay. Let's step back. Suppose there is no integral action, and I give you a G, okay, and say go and find me this proportional value of Kc about the system becomes unstable. You know how to do that. Plot the root locus, see where it crosses the axis, pick up the value of Kc. That is one data point way up at infinity. I'm saying it is somewhere here. Now I'm going to redo the same thing. I'm giving you the g, but I'm giving you the g with a different value of tau i. Tau i is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. For each value of tau i, you can plot that root locus and pick up the value of kc where it becomes unstable. Right? So that value of kc, is it going to be smaller than the previous one or larger than the previous one? 
That's what they are saying here. That's what I want you to understand. Okay? This statement says the effect of adding integral action, meaning the effect of decreasing tau i. When I'm adding integral action and decreasing tau i, okay, it is to destabilize the system uh, in terms of the amount of proportional action. Okay? That is, for a given value of kc, that is uh, tau i, for example, a horizontal line like this, that means you're fixing tau i. And then I keep increasing Kc until it becomes unstable. Okay? So that point is going to be, if it is on the left, it means it destabilizes. Integral action destabilizes. If it moves to the right, it means the integral action in the particular problem stabilizes it, meaning you have a larger range of Kc for which the system still remains stable. Is that clear? Is that any better? Otherwise, you have to ask questions. That's how. There is no formula. <laughs> In fact, there is there is no rule like this. Okay. Right. The only thing that we know is the controller is given by something like k t times one plus one over tau i s. That is the equation. That equation doesn't tell you anything about what this red statement is stating. What I want to make sure is that when you read a statement like this you are able to grasp the idea behind it. And the idea here is, the first thing that you need to get is, when I put an integral action, when I put a value for tau i, tau i infinity is one value, okay? That means I have no integral action. Then, given gc, I can plug that into g, I can from that find 1 plus g is equal to 0, I can use the root of this, I can pick up the value of kc, at which the system becomes unstable when there is no integral action. Okay? That is going to be a value of kz that you can locate. Now, this is a diagram that we have not seen at all so far. That is a diagram where I'm plotting tau i versus kc. There is no relation, there is no equation that you can plot. But in this graph, in your mind, you can think of a value of kc. If I go above that, the system becomes unstable. That information comes from the locus. Are you clear about that? Okay. Now, if you've done that, that is the first problem that we saw in root locus. The second problem is, I say, now I'm in introducing an integral action. What does the integral action do? It introduces the zero in the numerator. Okay. And so it changes the root locus. So you have a root locus diagram like this one. This diagram is for a fixed value of tau i. I fix tau i equals maybe 1 over 3 or 3 or whatever in this case. I get a diagram like this. I get a kc value off from here, this critical value. That is the value that I plotted in the other graph of kc versus tau i. Okay? It is just a point. When tau i is equal to 3, kc is somewhere there. Whatever the value that the kc happens to be. Now, I can go back and regenerate this graph by changing tau i. Okay. So, the graph will look different. I can pick up a new value of kc. Okay. And that kc could be anywhere. Okay. So, if I have changed from tau i from 3 to 2, for example, it could be here or it could be there. That depends on problem very specifically. Okay. So, if it is on the left hand side, what does this mean? It means that by adding integral action, are you destabilizing the system or stabilizing the system? You are destabilizing the system because now you can have only a lower value of Kc. If Kc exceeds that value, the system becomes unstable. So as you increase integral action, that particular case says that the system becomes progressively unstable. That means there's only a smaller range of Kc that you can use. The will become unstable. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the tuning problems. Okay. When we talk about tuning, uh, we're talking about finding the best value of Kz, tau i, and tau d. 
what are the criteria that we should think about? Okay. One is stability, the other one is dynamic response. And we'll conclude this course with uh, a review of those, uh, how we use that and what kind of empirical raw laws there are. But at this stage, all I'm trying to point out is these ideas that we have talked about in the curve, and you come across a statement like that, should make sense in your mind. Okay? That adding integral action destabilizes. What does this mean? Okay? It simply means that KC becomes smaller and smaller. Okay, another example. Now this is a PID controller. So you've seen P, PI, now we are looking at the PID controller. And uh, so the control controller itself is given here KC times 1 plus. Uh, 2 over 3s and uh, plus 1 over 3s. Okay, so which is the derivative action? This is the derivative action, and that is the integral action. Okay, and this is the process, a second-order process, and this is a measurement. Given this problem, uh, find the value of Kc for which the system is stable. This is an interesting problem. The procedure is exactly the same, so I'm going to kind of go through it very quickly. First step. Pardon me? Oh. Maybe I'm not using the right icon. I still haven't mastered this new program. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about figuring that out now. Okay. So the first step is given a problem like this, construct the open loop transfer function. That means open up the loop somewhere like this. It's actually good because you can just follow <laughs> what I'm saying and then you disappear. <laughs> and take the product of all the transfer functions in the loop. So in this case, it is Kc times this part, which is the tra controller transfer function. And these two are the process transfer function, the measurement transfer function. Okay. So that is G. Okay, recast it. This is not always necessary, as some of you have already found out. If you bring in MATLAB, it's not at all necessary. But if you bring it in exam, it may be convenient because it right away tells you at least a few points on the uh, co complex map. So just write it as in terms of poles and zeros. Now, watch that in the numerator, when you fact take the common factor denominator, you will get a quadratic. Okay, and that quadratic can always be factored like this. So for a PID controller, you will have two zeros. So two of these poles will be connected to those two of those zeros. The third one will go to infinity. Okay? That will be the structure that we saw. So this is how it's rearranged. And I want to focus on the uh, root worker diagram itself. So the clips for producing that, I think we have already seen there is really nothing new in that, but this is a, okay, maybe, <laughs> that's where they've gone, yeah. They have the wrong one here. <laughs> I don't know what is happening, there's a bug in the code. <laughs> Oh, 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 is that the one? It's not going away. <laughs> okay, so when I take that G that you see here and put it into MATLAB, and I want you to study the script that does that, it produces uh, root locus method. Oh my God, this is really messy. <laughs> okay. Generate it, I'll generate it again. My apologies, just bear with me. Let me open up the word version of that. <laughs> Actually not having any good code. There it is. Okay. So 
this is how the root locus diagram looks for that particular CID controller. Okay? And you will notice that there are four poles and two zeros. Okay? But what do you notice about this diagram? If I ask you to find, remember the question is find those values of KP for which the system is stable or unstable. You see that? So, how can you interpret there's a blow up of that particular region? And what do you see there? So, here, these are the uh, poles. Okay. So, it's coming and crossing here. Right? So, there is a particular value of KP that corresponds to this point. I could consider the command step because it goes to that. Right. That is this point. Okay. It's not a search number. But what happens to the control it continues to come back. Another value of KP as which the system gets restabilized. Okay. So really there is no structure in general that you can predict for every kind of problem. Every transfer function, every problem will have different root locus diagrams. That's why we need to generate them and try to understand. In this particular case, there is a range of values of KC for which the system is stable and there is another range where it is unstable. So we need to be able to interpret and identify those values of KC. Okay? Is it clear? So here is a blown up version of that particular graph. Okay. Now this is the whole graph uh, generated in MATLAB. So these are the zeros and this pole is connected to this zero and there is a pole that starts there that's connected to that zero because there are two zeros. The remaining two are going to infinity. They are connected. So the roots always start at the poles. There are four poles. When you put k equal to zero, the poles are the roots of the characteristic equation also. Okay? And they will evolve from their pole location as you change k. They, they will go, some of them will go towards infinity. And some of them will be attracted towards a zero. You can tell exactly how many of them depending on the numerator, degree of the numerator. Okay? That's all you can say. You cannot say which one is going to be connected to what. That you need to generate the graph to see. So this structure is what I want you to focus on, okay? because there is a range of values of Kc at which the there are positive values, so the system is unstable, but it is restabilized. Okay? So if you look at uh, the, the values are in the book, they identify these values as K equals 0 0.004 and K equals 2.4. Kc for that value turns out to be 6 and 360. So the system is stable for Kc values of less than 0.6 or Kc values of greater than 360. It is unstable in other regions. For any value of Kc between 0.6 and 360, it is unstable. Why is that? There is really no rational physical explanation that you can offer. The dynamics of the system is such that, that um, this is what happens. Okay. When we say the dynamics of the system, what do we mean? The process dynamics is there. It is interacting with the control dynamics, the controller, particularly the derivative controller. So the derivative controller would introduce this feature. Again, it's not common for all kinds of process systems. It's the interaction between the process dynamics and the controller dynamics that creates situations like this. So it is very important, and this problem is going to be important in interpreting one of the rules that I'm going to present later on. Okay? But just make sure that uh, you understand this. And what I would like you to do um, is take this problem, play with MATLAB. Maybe I'll put this as part of a, uh, the last assignment problem. Okay. The numbers in here are not quite right. And I want you to find out what are the correct values. K is not 0 0.004. It actually comes up with 0 0.0485. And what they're saying here is at that value of K, what should be the root, it should be purely imaginary. So it says it's plus or minus 0.1j. 
and when k equal to 2.4, it's delta minus 1.1k. Find out the correct values using the root of the benefit. So here is just a blown up version of the same thing, which clearly shows the two values are there, two values of Kc. So in this part, Kc is less than 0.6, and in this part, Kc is greater than 360, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Whatever this number is. Okay, and in the two, it is on the right hand side, so it is unstable. Okay, the next problem is a long problem, and I want to take the time to make sure that we go through this uh, uh, carefully. So let's just set up the problem and try to understand it. Okay, draw the root locus diagram for the control system shown in the figure. We had a PI controller. We are given what the controller is: Kc times one plus three over s. That means the degree or the extent of integral action is given to you. Okay, point three three three, if you like. And the process transfer function also is given. And uh, so you notice that it's effectively a third order transfer function. And the first question is build the simulink model for a bar. Try Kc equal to 1 and see whether the system is stable or not. Okay? And that is routine. We have seen that before. And I will show you quickly. It's the second question that it's the type of question I wanted to be able to understand and answer in an exam. Determine the value of Kc needed to obtain the root of the characteristic equation of the closed loop response, which has an imaginary form of 0.75. What does it mean? We need to understand that before we can answer the question. If you read that, what does that mean to you in your mind? Okay. Certain frequency of those oscillations. Okay. So, how would you do that? Okay, uh, let me just. Uh, so, we need to generate the root locus diagram. Okay, and uh, when you generate the root locus diagram, you will get a graph like this for this particular G. The given G, put in the open loop transfer function in MATLAB, and uh, it's uh, effectively a fourth degree polynomial, so there will be four curves, okay, four uh, loci of all the roots. And you need to find out what they are asking is find out the value of Kc where the imaginary part identify 0.75, draw a line at 0.75, identify those points where it is crossing that, these four locations. At those four locations, what are the values of Kc? Right? If you understood that, then you can go after it. That's what they're asking. Right. So this is a wonderful problem to understand things like that. Why are there four roots? Where are, how are they going? If you give a particular value of Kc, would all the roots have points on side? Obviously not. So if I ask you the question, how many such KC values will be there? Can you answer that? With this graph, with this graph, there will be four values of KC, right? But before I generate the graph, there is no way I can answer that. Right? And so you need to generate the graph and then say, this is nothing different from asking the question, when does the system become unstable? What is the difference between this question and the previous question? Previous question, when I say it becomes unstable, I'm automatically asking you for that location where it crosses the axis. Now I've said I'm not very worried about that, but I'm worried about a particular frequency. I want the system to have a particular response. Okay? So find those values of cases where the imaginary axis uh, it intersects point seven five. So in this particular graph, there are four locations that it should be. How do I go and find it? That's the next question to answer that. Okay. Um, any questions? Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah. 
Right, right. Right, right. Oh, by hand, you mean? Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> You're anticipating an exam question there, right? What, what, well, in such a case, I have to give you only a quadratic because okay. otherwise you have to be able to solve a cubic or <laughs> by hand. Okay, cubic you can solve in a calculator, but to solve the cubic by hand is going to be difficult. So I give you a quadratic, one that results in a quadratic equation. Then you find out the discriminant, the thing that is in square root, and that, yeah. You impose that condition on that. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? I think maybe we stop there because we're running out of time. But I will come back and do this problem in detail uh, in the next lecture.